Hey guys, how are you? Good to see you again. It's been how many days now, right? Thank you, Jason. Lord Jesus bless you. Since Friday, Friday was my last live stream. So it's been Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? Tuesday? Today's Tuesday, right? What's today? Wednesday. Wow. So it's been Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, four days. Sorry. Yesterday I had to do something. That's why. And then Monday, I don't know what happened. But good to see you guys. I'm just waiting for a few more faces to show up if they do, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hold on. Let me refresh. All righty then. Hey, first last, how are you? Yep. Uh-oh. Here goes Hater Wood. Is it ironic? This guy has got over 300,000 subscribers. Every live stream he gets about 700, but it blows up when I come on. It goes over 1,000. And yet he comes here and he picks on poor little me. I only got 23 people watching. I don't even have 10,000 subscribers. I can't even get 2,000 views on my pages. And I'm starting to hate this guy. You know, you're not supposed to envy, right? So ask God to heal me and sanctify me. But it's good to be back, right? Hopefully, the Lord Jesus will be pleased to use me again, his really profitless, worthless, wicked servant. May the Lord Jesus sanctify us. Truly, I need the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Just truly to walk in the life of the Spirit and just to despise and hate my flesh. May he crucify our flesh and destroy our flesh and the fruits of our flesh and fill us with fruit from the Spirit and life from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, love from the Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, holiness from the Spirit, so we can be more like our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be in love with Jesus, to worship Jesus, to love Jesus and live for Jesus, which I miserably fail to do. May God have mercy on me and be patient with me in Jesus' name. Good to see you. Good to see our dear brother, Al Dariosh. You guys may not know, Al Dariosh, may the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue, is one of the dearest brothers to my heart. He, him and I know each other personally, face to face. Al and his wonderful family used to attend my Bible study locally. When I used to teach a local Bible study, Al used to come faithfully. And I'm not just saying in front of him. He's a man who loves Jesus Christ. He's passionate love with Jesus Christ. Can you pray for him? Pray for Al Dariosh. Pray for his lovely wife. Pray for his four children, daughter and three sons. Pray the Lord Jesus bless him over abundantly in his household. Seal him and his family by the Spirit. Flood them in the love of Jesus Christ. The man is on fire for the Lord, and he's hungry for the Lord, and he has to travel from state to state. He's on the road <clears throat> driving a truck, and what he does all day is listen to lectures, sermons, and worship songs so that he can be in the Spirit worshiping Jesus. So pray for our brother Al Dariosh. Yeah. Yeah, listen, Hater Wood, someone just told me, if you really love me, you should be giving a shout out on your YouTube page saying, hey, Sam Shimon goes live, support him, subscribe and watch. Come on, man. If I was making the money you did, then I could focus on just doing ministry full time. Right? Daddy Warbucks. Hater, man. Hater. So good to see every one of you. We're going to start in a few minutes. There is so many topics I need to get around to by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I do cherish from all of you, honestly, I really mean this. Do pray without ceasing for me and my daughters. And here's what I need you to pray. See, look at this hater. Yes, it ain't big enough for you and me, huh? What a hater, dude. I made you, son. I made you. Anyway, do me a favor. Here's how you guys can pray for me. And I really cherish your prayers because the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous is... God's delight. God loves when those who are in Jesus Christ, clothed by the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, walking in the Spirit, pray because it delights his heart in Jesus' name. Right? So please pray, and here's how I need you guys to pray. Ask the Lord Jesus to give me complete, perfect victory over my flesh, that the Holy Spirit will give me the power to die to my flesh, crucify the passions of my flesh, Walk in holiness and purity. Be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Ask the Lord Jesus to give me self-discipline, self-control. To be a man that's prayed up, prayerful, worshipful, reading the Word, studying the Word, meditating on the Word, living it out, and also serving people by my actions, not just lip service. So please pray for that. 
I ask the Lord Jesus to bless my children and flood them in his love and keep them safe from all harm and provide for their needs and provide through me. I ask the Lord Jesus for health for them and I to get my health back, to keep losing this weight. And that I, if he tarries and he's pleased, I can see them grow up to be a godly woman who outlive me. And ask the Lord Jesus to provide the provisions to do this work and to give me the power to be a doer of his word. Can you guys please pray for me for those things and also fast if you can. I really need to be walking in the spirit, being filled with the fruit of the spirit and going to a higher level of holiness and purity and worship and love and devotion and service. Right? Please, honestly, I mean that. I know my imperfections fully well. I know my issues and I hate that I struggle and succumb to my flesh so easily, right? Such as anger, impatience. I, I, I just don't want that anymore. I want people when they see me, they'll say, I see Jesus in him. I see the love of Jesus in him. I see the beauty of Jesus in him. I see the holiness of Jesus in him. So I don't just be head knowledge, honestly. And I mean this, I need your prayers because I can't do it. And I've been begging Lord for victory, and I need the power of the Holy Spirit just to finally die to this wicked flesh. It's disgusting. All right? In other words, what I'm asking for prayer is that I don't want to be like David Wood, who's a tyrant, a dictator. Who, what he says goes. So if he says, Sam, I'm going to be going. <laughs> and again, another thing I need you to pray for, pray for our friend Andrew Martin. Hold on. Save us from fumes. Keep us safe. Man, there's fumes coming out of here. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe I need to open a window. Okay, anyway. Yeah, pray for Andrew Martin. Pray for this young man. He has an open heart. Though he's an atheist, he hungers for Jesus. And it's such a blessing that he would come and listen to me. That blesses my heart. And I pray I can be a blessing to him. Before I say anything, uh, there's like smell of fumes in here. Hold on. Uh, let me tell this guy. Hey, uh, yo, Alex. Hope it's not carbon monoxide so I don't die. Hold on. Hey, bro, just double check your house to see if you got carbon monoxide because that means I'll be dead in less than 10 minutes and I'll be in heaven, hopefully by the grace of Jesus. And I don't want to leave this world and give David all the attention because if I go, then that means the world only has David Wood to listen to. And there goes Christianity and Islam is going to get stronger than ever before if I leave him behind. Yeah. Hold on. I'm, hold on, man. Let me see. Oh, that's it. Oh, I'm dying. I'm dying. Hold on. Uh, in bingo, bingo, I got it. Okay. Yeah, but you may hear. Okay. All right. Okay. One thing that I dislike being away, I mean, thank God for our brother here, Idiota Apologetics. Pray for him and his family. Pray the Lord will sustain him and bless him. They've been such a blessing. They've let me stay here, saving me tons of money I don't have. One thing I don't like, I haven't been able to hit the weights. I've been doing cardio. I've been walking. But, man, I want to hit the weights to get my muscle tone. I'm starting to get small. And I'm starting to look like David, very flabby. Yeah, hey, right? That's not video. Okay, good to see you guys. Uh, as you know, we wait a few minutes until the regulars show up. Hopefully, the regulars will number in the thousands. We got to make sure this YouTube page blows up, right? So that David Wood, Hater Wood, will eat my dust. What I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, what are these? All right? Yeah, Pistol Pete, and I hate doing push-ups, but I'm going to start doing them. My show, uh, Genetically, Pistol Pete, genetically, I've always had narrow shoulders and wide hips. Always. I've always struggled with that. And right now I have an amazingly V-taper. My V-taper is amazing, Pistol Pete. You know that? Because I have an upside-down V, and it's amazing. Upside-down V. And when I do a handstand, it's a perfect V. So don't hate but by the grace of Jesus, by this year, I'm going to have a right side V. All right. It don't hate. They say if you have wide hips, that means you're designed to have a lot of babies. So maybe, you know, if I maybe identify as a woman, right? No, I'm just kidding. All jokes aside. 
while I celebrated my birthday with Hater Wood. He was here in town. And, dude, do you think this guy would give me attention even on my birthday? Yeah. Okay, with that said, we're going to begin in a few minutes, right? In a few minutes. I want to finish Shola Scriptura. Lord Jesus willing, if the Lord Jesus gives me the health that I need, gives me the holiness that I need to delight his heart and the provisions, I'm going to be doing a lot of series, a lot of series for the YouTube channel. I'm going to finish my series, God willing. Yeah, idiota, it's like something in my mouth. So just double check so you see we're safe. But yeah, I did. I opened the window. Okay, I'm going to be doing a lot of series on various topics. I'm going to finish my series on Jesus being the Archangel Michael. We're going to go back to that. I'm going to do series on various topics, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the authority of Scripture, salvation, common objections by Muslims, Jew, Jews, and Joe's witnesses. So I have a lot of stuff I want to talk about, right, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord is pleased to use me because he doesn't need me. So keep praying. And, hey, I don't know if David Wood is still listening, but I got a big announcement for you guys. A big announcement, and I'm going to need you to be praying for me from now till the event itself. I'm going to fill you in on the details as I get more information. But in the springtime, if God is pleased, and what a perfect time, because by spring, hopefully, I'll be settled and I've started a new phase in my life by the grace of Jesus Christ. But have you guys heard the big news? Amen, Virginia. Have you guys heard the big news? Anybody hear the big news? Yep, Q, the one heard it. I officially challenged James White on my Facebook pages, and I issued the challenge in such a way that if he didn't accept, he'd be exposed as a coward, and he had no choice but to accept. So I'm going to be debating him, God willing, in the springtime, in Detroit, God willing, if everything falls in place, on limited atonement, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and his manhandling and butchering of Romans 9, in light of its immediate context, which is Romans 9 to 11, even though he likes to quote simply Romans 9 and pull it out of the context of Romans 10 and 11, because that entire unit is the context of Romans 9. So pray for me to be filled with the Spirit, to be walking in the Spirit, to be holy unto the Lord, to get healthier, so that when it happens, I will be in the Spirit, so I can be gracious to Him as I destroy and decimate His arguments. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to do to Him in the debate what I have not done to any person in any debate previously. I'm going to... I want to be gracious when I say this, and I want to be Christ-like so people don't ask, accuse me of being nasty. I am going to do to him what I've never done to any debate opponent. I'm going to decimate his arguments and expose him for being someone who does not submit to the authority of Scripture. He pays lip service to Scripture. And I'm going to cut him down to size by the power of the Holy Spirit because he's a bully that uses the dividing line as a bully pulpit to bully Christians, to mock Christians, to berate Christians, <clears throat> and intimidate them. And David Wood knows I'm a bully destroyer. I'm going to be as gracious as I can, but I'm going to pull no punches, and I'm going to do to him what I've never done to anyone. Right? I'm going to, by the grace of God, decimate his man-made doctrine of limited atonement and his shameless butchering of Romans 9, by ignoring its context, right? No, it's certain relief. I'm just being honest. because From now on, I'm going to avoid him like the plague, and I'm just going to wait for debate night. But I promise you, by the power of Jesus Christ, I'm going to do to him what I've never done to any debate opponent previously because he deserves what he's going to get because he claims to be a Christian, calling people to a higher standard, and yet he fails to live up to that standard, and mocks Christians, berates Christians, talks down to Christians, and yet he's shocked when people give him a taste of his own medicine because he's oblivious to how nasty he is. And may God have mercy on him. I've tried 
to extend an olive branch and bring reconciliation, you can't be reconciled to this man. Only God can open his heart and mind to see how nasty he is. And God have mercy on him and on me. Because again, guys, I admit I'm nasty. I'm being honest. I admit I have anger issues. I'm impatient. And I admit I need the Holy Spirit to sanctify me. But I don't pretend to be the standard of apologetics, calling people to a higher standard and rebuking those who do not do apologetics to the glory of God, all the while being the nastiest jerk among all the apologists out there. Jonathan Soko, you may think he embarrassed him on Romans 9, but I'm going to decimate him on Romans 9. Because Jonathan Soko, here, let me let me call you out and see if you understand the context of Romans 9. Where and when does Romans 9 begin and end? Let's see how much you know about Romans 9, or if you're simply parroting James White and blindly following him. Let's see. The context of Romans 9 begins when and ends when. He is. He is a Christian, but he's a nasty one. And there are nasty jerks among all camps. Remember I said that? Among all the major branches of Christianity, there are nasty jerks. I can be a nasty jerk. Forget about David Wood. He's got a monopoly on being nasty. But we still love him, though. Jonathan Soko, I want to see if you've really studied Romans 9 in context or simply parroted James White and blindly believed his exegesis. More like eisegesis. So, Jonathan Soko, when does the context of Romans 9 begin and end? Let's see if you really know. Because he said he's, he defeated Leighton Flowers. Far from it. I want to see if you know. I want to give this man a minute to explain to me when does the context of Romans 9 begin and end? No, I'm talking about in the book of Romans itself, Michael. I know Romans 9 cites the Old Testament copiously. Lord willing, in the springtime. I made it where he could not back down. He had to accept. He will, Abraham, go. By the power of the triumph God, I have no doubt. Jonathan, I don't have all day. Can he answer? I don't know what you're, why you're mentioning my, my ex-wife. Uh, what has she got to do with this discussion? I have no idea. He won't. He won't touch me on Islam. That he knows he won't do. I guess Jonathan Soko left. Okay, that's fine. Yep, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, 19. All right. With that said, let's begin. We got the regulars here. Let's begin. All right. Are we ready? So pray for that. It's going to take place in the springtime in Detroit, God willing. Perfect time for me, by the way, because I'm in a major transition. By then, hopefully, by the grace of God, I'll have settled in. And a new chapter in my life will have begun by the grace and mercy of the triumph God. In Jesus' name. Yeah, my birthday was Saturday, September 14th. Okay, with that said, yep, come on, hit that like button, guys. Let's begin. Ready? Are we ready now? Let's begin means we're not going to talk about anything other than the topics at hand, right? We're not going to bring up irrelevant issues, irrelevant questions. We're going to focus on the topics. And what I'm going to begin with is Sola Scriptura, finish the discussion that I began in the previous sessions. Right? Do we there? Sola Scriptura. I'm going to finish it, and the Lord willing, we'll talk about other issues. But that means when we begin, we're going to focus on Sola Scriptura, Deity of Christ, Omniscience of the Holy Spirit. Nothing else. Focus on this. If you have questions related to these issues, please ask me. In time, I'll address all these other issues. In time, by the grace of the triumph God. So we love you, Father. We need you, Father. We depend on you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We need your Son, and we need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us. Especially me. Cleanse me, Lord Jesus, of all my flesh and the fruits of the flesh. Lord Jesus, the Son of the Most High, purify me. Purify every one of us and forgive us, Lord Jesus. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Give me the power of your Spirit not to succumb to the flesh, to crucify the flesh and walk in the life of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be more like you. 
and save me from my imperfections. Save us from our imperfections. And we love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us for the glory of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, please save us from harm. Save us from the evil one. Crucify our flesh and fill us with life and fruit from your presence. Anoint my mouth to speak clearly, to speak powerfully, to speak passionately, to speak correctly, Holy Spirit. To recall the scriptures and interpret them correctly, Holy Spirit. And save us from attacks of the enemy. And please loosen my tongue. Bless your people, Holy Spirit, with wisdom from your presence, with knowledge from your presence. And guide us into all truth. And Holy Spirit, fill my lungs and chest and throat with, throat with life, with breath from your presence. To have the, the health that I need to glorify the Lord Jesus. And make us holy unto the Lord to delight his heart. We need you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. All right. Let's finish. Let's finish my discussion on Sola Scriptura. Where we left off, we left off last session demonstrating that particular books of the New Testament claim to be written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Specific authors of the New Testament claim to be taught by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, receiving wisdom from the Holy Spirit to write down the very revelations of God. Do you remember that? Do you guys remember that? And we left off with John's witness in the book of Revelation where John in Revelation goes out of his way to affirm that the things he wrote down in that scroll, which he called Bible, were the very revelations that the risen Lord Jesus gave to him from heaven in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that? You guys remember, right? Because I want to finish it off. I want to finish off Sola Scriptura, and I'm going to ask specific questions to those who deny Sola Scriptura, not to put them on on the spot or to attack them as the Lord loosens my tongue, but to show them why I believe the Bible does teach its sole sufficiency, right? So you can at least understand why Protestants affirm sola scriptura. If it's properly defined, which I did in the first session that started off the series. Okay. So are we ready? Are ready to discuss the evidence confirming that the Bible teaches Sola Scriptura and that the different authors of the New Testament were fully aware they were writing down the words of God because I'm going to look at the Gospel of John. So give me your undivided attention for the sake of the Lord Jesus, for the glory of Christ. Let's go to John 14.26. Does John, in the Gospel of John, give us an indication that he's writing down the words of of the Lord Jesus by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat so you understand what I'm going to establish here. Does John, in the Gospel of John, give us any indication that he's writing down the words of the Lord Jesus as inspired by the Holy Spirit, as taught to him by the Holy Spirit? Okay? Let's see if he gives us any indication that the Gospel he wrote, he did so by instruction from the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. Let's read. Jesus speaking, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, meaning the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Let's post that verse one more time so you can follow along and understand the implications of the Lord's promises to his immediate disciples. Notice what the Holy Spirit will do. Notice what the Lord says the Holy Spirit will do when he comes to his disciples, one of whom is John, the author of this gospel. He, the Holy Spirit, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So it will be the function, the role of the Holy Spirit to remind Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples everything that Jesus said to them with an added caveat. Not only will the Holy Spirit remind them of what Jesus said. Hey, do you remember Jesus said this at this time to these people? He will then enable and empower them to understand what Jesus said. Not just remember what Jesus said, but understand what Jesus said, right? 
John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, verses 12 to 13. And then we're going to go back to 2 Timothy 3. May the Lord increase our numbers for his glory. John 16, 12 to 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You're not ready for them spiritually and emotionally and mentally. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will guide you into all truth. Right? Whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, notice what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Understand what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to remind them of everything Jesus said and enable them to understand what Jesus said and also reveal new things to them that they were not ready to receive at the time of Christ. There are things that Jesus wanted to share, but they were not ready to receive them. So the Holy Spirit would then empower them to reach a level of understanding that they would then be able to receive the things from the Spirit that they could not handle when Jesus was with them. Are you with me there? Now, how would this apply to us today? This is a promise to them. This is how it applies. There are certain teachings, certain doctrines that certain Christians are not able to understand. And no matter how much you try to help them understand, they won't be able to take it in because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit determines when that person is able to take those things in. So you can't rush a person's spiritual maturity. You can't force someone to understand. It's the Holy Spirit who determines when you are able to take in the things he wants you to take in at the time that he's appointed. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if there are things that I'm teaching you and I'm as clear as humanly possible, in other words, I've explained it several different ways. And I've done my best to explain it as clearly as possible. And you're not able to take it in. That means that you're not ready for it. Shelve it. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> right? Don't stress over it. Leave it to Holy Spirit in his timing to then empower you to reach a level of understanding so that eventually you then can take it in at the time he's appointed for you. Now, let me bring it out even further. There is no better communicator, no clearer speaker than Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only perfect human communicator who ever walked this earth. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, and when he speaks, he speaks perfectly. Yet even though Jesus was the perfect communicator, he says, you're still not able to take in what I have to say to you. If that's true of Jesus, who is the perfect communicator, and no one can speak better than Jesus or more clearly than Jesus, then why are you shocked that there are people who are unable to understand what you say? Are you with me there? I want him to sink in. I'm pausing because I want it to sink in. If Jesus, who's the perfect human communicator, who spoke perfectly and flawlessly, states to the disciples, you are not ready to take in what I'm about to say. Not because Jesus isn't clear, but because they were not mature enough to take it in then why would you be shocked that there are people who simply won't get it because it's not time for them to get it? So shelve it. Leave it be. So 
So now to go back to the promise of the Lord Jesus. Jesus says, it will be the Holy Spirit who reminds you of the things I've said, right? Who's going to remind them? Who's going to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus said and help them understand? The Holy Spirit, right? That was John 14, 26. Okay. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38, 39. Because I'm going to show you that John claims to be written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit taught him, reminded him, and enabled him to understand the things that Jesus said. John 7, 38, 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, pay attention. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What are these rivers that will flow within you? 739 tells you, watch, 739 tells you. But this spake he of the spirit. See, Jesus saying, if you believe in me, I will give you the Holy Spirit to indwell you to satisfy your thirst, to quench your hunger, right? To fill you with love and faith and wisdom and understanding and preserve you forever. So the rivers of the living water is the Holy Spirit indwelling you. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the rivers of living waters refer to the Holy Spirit that would eventually indwell the apostles, indwell believers, empower believers, and seal believers, and preserve them forever, right? But when would the Spirit be given? After Jesus was glorified. Meaning after his death, resurrection, and glorification, the Spirit would be given. Glorification means his death, bodily resurrection to mortality, and his ascension into heaven. Then would the Holy Spirit be given, right? So the Spirit was not given until Christ was glorified. Notice John 7, 39 one more time. Let's post it one more time so you can get it. Yep, comforted the Holy Spirit. John 7, 38, 39. 39 specifically, let's look at it one more time. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive, would receive eventually. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So understand the implication. After Christ would be glorified, the Holy Spirit would then be given to Jesus' followers. The Holy Spirit was only given to his followers after Jesus was glorified. And when the Holy Spirit was given to them, that's when the Holy Spirit would remind them and teach them all that Jesus had said and enable them to understand, right? Once Christ was glorified, the Spirit would be given to them, and the Spirit would teach the apostles like John, remind the apostles like John, this is what Jesus said, and now this is what he meant. Right? If you got those two points, now I'm going to show you where John tells you that this gospel was written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If you understand those two points, now I'm going to show you where John shows you, I wrote this gospel by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, are you ready for the evidence from John where John basically tells you, I wrote this by the Holy Spirit? You ready? All right. John 12, verses 12 to 16. John 12, verses 12 to 16. Let's see if you catch it. Those of you who are listening attentively by the grace of God's Spirit, you'll catch it. If you've been paying attention, let's see. Yep, hit that like button. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, there we go. Yeah. when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, 
Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first. Catch it? They didn't understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, let's see if you catch it. When Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Who caught it? Verse 16, who caught it? At first, they didn't understand. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things. Who caught it? Why was it, why did it take Jesus' glorification for them to remember and understand? Why did they only remember and understand after Christ was glorified? Why? Why was it after the glorification of Christ that they remembered and understood? Thank you, medic. Medic got it. All the rest of you got it. Because that's when the Holy Spirit was given them. After Christ was glorified, the Holy Spirit was given them, who then reminded them, and they understood. So you see how John just told you, I wrote this because the Holy Spirit reminded me of this and helped me finally understand what it meant. You got gotcha? it? John chapter 12, verses 12 to 17. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 17. So I've just made a thorough case that the individual authors of the New Testament knew they were writing the words of God by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They knew it. So they knew their writings were the very words of God. Okay. Hold on a second. Someone's knocking at the door. Sorry, I'm going to have to. Sorry for distraction. Hold on. Right in here? Maybe it's nothing. Right now? No, I was tasting it in my mouth. Oh, you're tasting it? Yeah. Is the window open? Yeah, I just opened it right now. Just in case. Yeah, no. I just opened Actually, let's close it. Okay. I just want to get some, some samples. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to be talking over here. So. Okay. Sorry, guys. I had to open up the door. So, you guys with me so far, right? So let's go to John 12. I'm sorry. John, the Gospel of John, chapter chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. John chapter 2, verse 12, 17. So what happens? Live stream, guys. Expect the unexpected. John chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. No, it isn't. It's the gas man. Because I got a lot of gas. <laughs> All right, read with me. After this, he went down. Let's see if you guys catch it. Let's see how many of you are going to catch this. After this... He went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple, found in the temple, <clears throat> where's verse 14? Somebody deleted it? The Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Yep, someone deleted 14. Oh, boy. 
Protestant, you drop the ball, I'm going to fire you. And I'm going to stop paying you nothing. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Now watch. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Now pay attention, 17. And his disciples remembered, his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. <whistles> the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, that Jesus was zealous in fulfillment of the Old Testament. But it says in 17, they remembered this. Who made the connection? Who made the connection? Come on, guys. What does it mean they remembered? Is this a fulfillment of Jesus' promise? That the Holy Spirit will come and remind you of all the things that I said. So notice they remembered because the Holy Spirit had come. You understand the implication of what John is saying? I'm writing down the things that Jesus said as I remember them because it's Holy Spirit reminding me and help me understand what he said. So is John claiming that he's writing down that which Holy Spirit is reminding him, teaching him, and helping him to understand? Thank you, friends. Do you see that? Who would have thought that John has in his gospel a confirmation that he's writing it down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Who would have thought that? John 14, 26. But now the other example. John 2, same chapter, John 2, verses 18 to 22. John 2, verses 18 to 22. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear, rear it up in three days? You're going to raise this temple up in three days? Watch. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word what Jesus had said. Notice they didn't remember and understand until Jesus was raised from the dead because that's when he would be glorified, and that's when the Spirit would be sent to remind them of these things he said and did and understand them finally. Who caught it? Amen, Billy Mandalay. So in these last three sessions, I provided ample proof from the New Testament authors, from the new different New Testament books, that authors like Paul, like Luke, like John, like Peter, were all aware that they were preaching and writing down the revelations of God by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if anyone tells you that the New Testament writers did not think they were inspired when they wrote or spoke, whoever tells you that doesn't know what he or she is talking about. Right? Now I'm going to show you how one book confirms another and one book demonstrates the fulfillment of a promise given in another book. This is the beauty of the Bible. Different books written by different authors at different times, but perfect supernatural divine consistency. One writer says something, and another writer either confirms it or gives us more details to understand it or records the fulfillment of a prophet a promise, fulfillment of a prophecy stated elsewhere. Let me give you an example. Let's go to John 15, 26 to 27.
John 15, 26 to 27. But when the comfort is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth proceeded from the Father, he shall testify me. So notice, the Holy Spirit will bear witness, testify of the Lord Jesus. And he also shall bear witness. So not only will the Holy Spirit bear witness, but he'll bear witness with you. So the Holy Spirit in union with you, all of you will bear witness and testify. Beautiful. Because you have been with me from the beginning. Uh, would you be able to let yourself out or yeah? Sure. God bless you, my friend. Yeah, you're good. Um, I wasn't picking anything up. I sampled the other rooms. Everything beautiful? The gas meter. So I'm not going to die and meet Jesus today. No. All right. Not today. Even though that would be the best thing. It won't be, it won't be today. <laughs> It'll be when he says, but not Thank today. You. Lord Jesus bless okay. you. All right, man. All right. So notice the Holy Spirit will come. He'll bear witness, testify about me, and you will bear witness. So the apostles with the Holy Spirit, the apostles with the Holy Spirit will bear witness of Jesus, right? That's a promise, right? That's a promise. The Holy Spirit will come and bear witness of me, and you will bear witness of me. So the Holy Spirit will empower you to be my witnesses. But John doesn't record explicitly that promise. Even though the gospel of John is a fulfillment of the promise because the gospel is bearing witness to Jesus. But let me show you the promise fulfilled in another book of the New Testament. Acts 5.32. Acts 5.32. Acts 5.32. And we, Peter speaking on behalf of the apostles, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost. Bam. Promise fulfillment. Whom God hath given to them that obey him. John records Jesus' promise and Luke records its fulfillment. You, my disciples, and the Holy Spirit will bear witness of me. Acts 5.32, Peter speaking on behalf of the apostles, says... We are witnesses of these things concerning Jesus, and so is the Holy Spirit. Promise fulfillment. Promise in John, fulfillment in Acts. You getting it? Am I boring you, putting you to sleep? Are you getting it? Is it exciting you to see the depth and the beauty and the power of God's word, the Holy Scriptures? No, I'm not buffering. I'm okay. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, another promise fulfillment. Another promise fulfillment. Are you ready? Okay. John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. So he's going to not only remind you of the things I've said, but reveal new things to you, things that you're not ready for that I cannot share with you, right? Right? And then John 14, 26. One more time. John 14, 26. One more time. And then we're going to go into 2 Timothy so we can finish it and talk about the other two subjects. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost from the Father who sent my name, he shall teach you all things. So he's going to teach you and reveal new things to you and bring all things unto your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, fulfillment, 1 Corinthians 2.13. He will teach you and then reveal new things to you that I haven't revealed while I was with you. Well, King of Kings, if you're not praying for me to be filled with wisdom and knowledge and depth from the Spirit, I can't reveal the deeper things of God. It has to be the Holy Spirit filling me for the glory of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Bam! Promise fulfillment. 
John 14, 26, the Holy Ghost shall teach you. 1 Corinthians 2, 13, Paul says, the Holy Ghost is teaching me, teaching us. Promise fulfillment. Promise in John. The record of the fulfillment in 1 Corinthians 2, 13, showing you that you can take Jesus at his word he cannot lie, will never lie, and he will do everything that he has promised. Do you see it? These should encourage you. Jesus makes a promise and he fulfills it. Right? And memory says he will reveal new things to you, things that you're not ready for now, but he'll make them known to you, right? Right? Things that Jesus could not share with them because they were not ready. And so the Holy Spirit would come and make it known to them. Thank you, Andrew. In Jesus' name, you will see me one day because I'm coming to Australia in this lifetime if the Lord is pleased because I want to visit people there. Okay, now let me show you the Holy Spirit revealing new things to the apostles that Jesus did not mention while he was on earth. Do you want to see the other Part of the fulfillment of the promise, the Holy Spirit revealing new things to the apostles that Jesus did not share with them on earth. Are you ready? Are you ready for the other part of the promise and its fulfillment? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 of 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 of 5. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Watch here. Holy Spirit will reveal new things, things that I cannot share with you now. Okay, let's see. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Bam. Paul is saying, the Spirit is telling me this. The Spirit speaks. He's a person. And he's going to reveal things to me that Jesus didn't reveal while he was on earth. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Devils teaching false doctrines and misleading people. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Being hypocrites, saying one thing, doing another. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Having no remorse or conviction of their lies and their shame. Forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Bam! Did you catch it? The Holy Spirit expressly says, these things will happen in the latter days. Wait, Paul. But these things were not explicitly mentioned by Jesus while he's on earth. Yeah, Jesus said there were things... He could not reveal at that time, but the Spirit would reveal it to us later on. Promise fulfillment. Promise fulfillment. Right? Do you see how the different writers of the New Testament miraculously confirm one another, even though they're not aware that they're doing so? And that the writers of the New Testament claim to be writing down the very words, revelations of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Are you seeing this? Now, what's the relevance of all of this data? Or datum, that's singular. Remember the objection that those who don't believe in Sola Scriptura are raised. When you cite 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, they say that when Paul says all scriptures God breathed, there he's talking about the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So what I just did, I went through the different books of the New Testament to show you when Paul made that claim, he wasn't limiting it to the Old Testament. Go back to the previous sessions, and I gave you ample proof that when Paul said all scripture is inspired by God, God breathed, he wasn't limiting it to the Old Testament, but he was referring to every scripture, 
every book that the Spirit would produce, not just the Old Testament writings, but all the books that the Spirit produced up until the time of Paul's writing, which includes his own writings and Luke's gospel, which he called Scripture, and put it on the level of Moses, right? So if anyone tells you 2 Timothy is only referring to the Old Testament, correct them. I gave you the evidence in the previous sessions and in this session, and Lord willing, in the description box, I will put links to my articles where I address the same objection. When Paul said all scripture is God-breathed, he was including every writing that the Spirit would produce and had produced as scripture up until the time of Paul's writing that statement, which would include Paul's own letters and the Gospel of Luke, which he explicitly identifies as scripture. Okay. The second point I made, they're going to tell you 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 only refers to the Old Testament. So if the Old Testament is sufficient and you need nothing else, then you don't need the New Testament. That's one of the objections I've heard those who oppose Sola Scriptura bring up. Well, this proves too much. It proves all you need the Old Testament. You don't need the New Testament. And I say, on the contrary, if Paul is saying that the Old Testament is sufficient to give you the wisdom to know how to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ, and the Old Testament teaches you every good work that you must do to be complete in the sight of God, how much more is the Bible sufficient now that we have the 27 books in the New Testament? In other words, if the Old Testament was sufficient to get you saved through faith in Christ and to equip you with every good work, that means now with the 27 books in the New Testament, it's now super sufficient. Which means you really don't need anything but the Bible. If the Old Testament is good enough, with the New Testament, it's super good, super sufficient, more than enough to thoroughly equip you for every good work. So what do you need besides the Bible? So this objection backfires against those who try to refute Sola Scriptura. You with me there? So beware of those objections. Paul was a limiting in the Old Testament, wasn't taught about the New Testament, and therefore, if it's the Old Testament, that means the Old Testament is sufficient. You don't need the New Testament. I've now shown you how to refute these two objections. Right? So let's go now to 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Because now I'm going to show you how to interpret 2 Timothy 3 and use it to affirm sola scriptura. Because it does affirm sola scriptura. Right? Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. We'll talk about other things after this, if you're up to it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now notice the purpose of Scripture. Why did God give you Scripture? Because it's profitable for doctrine. It teaches you what you're supposed to believe and how to live. For reproof, for rebuking you when you need to be rebuked. So use it to rebuke someone. For correction, to correct you when you're in sin or holding to something false. For instruction in righteousness, to teach you how to live a righteous life. So that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. In other words, the Bible thoroughly equips you for every good work necessary to be complete in the sight of God. Do you understand? The Bible thoroughly equips you for every good work that you must know and do to be complete in the sight of God, correct? You got it? Therefore, can someone who doesn't believe in Sola Scriptura, now this is for the camp that doesn't believe in Sola Scriptura, can someone show me a good work that a Christian must know and do or something they must know and believe that's not in the scripture. Come on, I need you now to interact and participate with me. Can someone show me either something that I must know and believe or something I must know and do to be complete in the sight of God that's not in the scripture? 
point to something that I need to do or believe to be complete in God's sight that's not in the scripture. Andrew Martin sounds like a believer already. In Jesus' name, you will be. Name one. So wait, friends, Tuma, you just contradict Paul and you prove that Paul doesn't know what he's talking about because Paul says the scripture will keep you for every good work. That's what I was waiting for. Now, Franz Toma just proved Paul is wrong because Paul said every good work that you need to engage in is in scripture. So if I needed to know how to make communion and it's not in scripture, that means Paul is wrong. You see now the dilemma? Anything you show me that I must know or do means Paul is wrong. You see now the dilemma I put people in that don't believe in sola scriptura. The moment you tell me you need this, Paul is wrong. Therefore, if you're going to take credit for the Bible, if you're a Catholic and you tell me you gave us the Bible, then you gave us a wrong book. You gave us 2 Timothy, which contains an error because Timothy says everything I need to know and do is in the scriptures, but you just proved to me there are things that I need to know and do that are not in the scriptures, which means Second Timothy is wrong, so you were wrong for canonizing it. You see the dilemma I just put them in. You who reject Sola Scriptura, there's no way out of this dilemma. No way out of this di dilemma. This is why I say, if you understand 2 Timothy 3 and interpret it properly, this is a nightmare for those who do not affirm Sola Scriptura. You can't get around this. And I've heard the best the other side has to offer, Roman Catholics, Orthodox. You with me there? Can you now mention something I need to know to be saved or something I need to do to be saved? That's not a scripture. If you do, Paul is wrong. Because what did Paul say? That Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures from childhood, which are able to make him wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and that the Scriptures thoroughly equip the man of God for every, not most, not some, for every good work to be complete in the sight of God. I, I'll, I'll try to get there, Andrew. Just I want to unpack this and spend some time on this. Now, Jesus reigns. If I need an authority to interpret Scripture, then it's going to be in the Scripture, right? Because if he's telling me I need something, then the Bible is going to have to tell me I need that thing. Otherwise, that means the Bible failed to tell me <clears throat> something vitally important for me to know in order to be saved. And thoroughly equipped for every good work. You get it, Jesus reigns? So if I need an authority to interpret scripture and the Bible doesn't tell me I need an authority to interpret scripture, they just showed me there's something I need to know and act upon that's not in scripture proving that Paul is wrong. How are you going to get out of this dilemma? Now, wasn't that a better point, Andrew Martin? If I need an authority to understand Scripture, then that means the Scripture will tell me I need an authority. If it doesn't, you just demonstrate there's something in Scripture, there's something I need to know that's not in Scripture, and then the Scripture is wrong. Friends, how do you know that Jesus said that if the scripture didn't tell you? You see, you refuted yourself again. Friends, notice what you had said. Friends, Brother Sam, didn't Jesus say what? How do you know Jesus said that? If the Bible didn't tell you, friends, that Jesus said to the disciples, what they bind on earth shall be bound, how do you know that Jesus said that to the disciples? You see, you can't get out of this dilemma, can you? Anything you show me has to be in Scripture 
Because if it's not in scripture, you just falsified scripture, which means your church was wrong for canonizing that book, which contradicts scripture. So give me something. I want to have fun. Give me something else. What do I need to believe? What do I need to do to be complete in the sight of God that's not in Scripture? I'll give you two that they'll bring up, showing they don't understand the argument. I'll bring up two that I've heard, which shows they don't understand the argument. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the two that they'll raise against you to show you? That you need more than scripture? Okay. Number one, James 1, 4 says, you need patience to be perfect and complete in the sight of God. See, you need patience. So you need more than scripture. James 1, verse 4. Watch here. They quote that, right? I've heard Catholics quote it all the time. James 1, 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting, wanting nothing. Aha! See? You need patience. Not just scripture. Wait, 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 wait. You just quoted scripture that told me what I need to be complete. In other words, if the scripture didn't tell me I need patience to be complete, how would I know that I need patience to be complete if it wasn't in scripture? Bam! So the scripture told me what I needed to be complete. You see it? The other objection is, well, you can't have sola scriptura without a scriptura. And you need to know the canon of the Bible. And you need an authority to tell you what that canon is. So here's the other objection. You can't have a sola scriptura without a scriptura, without scripture. And you need to know the canon of the scripture to function under sola scriptura, and therefore you need an authority to tell you what scripture is, right? You, you understand the objection? Okay, you understand the objection? So I can refute it now? Okay. So wait, you're telling me I need to know the canon of scripture in order for scripture to be complete. Therefore, I have to have the knowledge of what the scriptures are to be complete, right? You with me there? I pray in Jesus' name I lose more weight, Charlie. Charlie, it's you I'm in Chicago. So Paul is wrong again because Paul told me everything I need to know to be saved is in the scriptures. And every good work that I need to engage in will be in the scriptures. So if knowing the canon of scripture was something important for me to be complete, it has to be in the Bible. Otherwise, if it's not in the Bible, you just prove that Paul is wrong again, which means you are wrong for canonizing Paul, so you gave me the wrong canon. Do you understand what happened right now? So let me try it again. I'll repeat it again. So you're telling me I have to know the canon of Scripture in order to know what scriptures are so I can be complete. So now you've just showed me there's something I need to know to be complete in the sight of God that's not in scripture, which means Paul is wrong when he said that everything I need to know to be saved and every good work I need to engage in to make me complete will be in scripture because the scriptures do not give me the knowledge of the canon, which you say I need to have to be complete, which means Paul is wrong, which means you are wrong for giving me Timothy as part of the canon, so you canonized the wrong book and gave me the wrong canon. Right? Did you understand how this now backfires against them too? Well, Hayden, one more time. If I need to have knowledge of the canon, the number of books that God inspired for me 
to be complete in the sight of God. Didn't Paul say in 2 Timothy, Hayden, that the scriptures make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus? So everything you need to know to be saved are in the scriptures. And didn't Paul say that the scriptures tell you every good work that you need to engage in to be complete inside of God? Nothing is excluded. Everything you need to know and do are in the scriptures to be complete. Well, if I needed to know what the canon is, if I had to have knowledge of the canon to be complete, and it's not in the Bible, that means Paul is wrong because there's something not contained in scriptures that I need to know to be complete, contradicting Paul. So if Paul is wrong, or if 2 Timothy is wrong, that means the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church was wrong for canonizing 2 Timothy, which means they gave us the wrong canon. You get it? How are they going to get out of this? Now, think of a way to get out of this dilemma that these individuals have put themselves in with their assault against Sola Scriptura. But even beyond that, even beyond that, which canon of which church? Which canon of which church? The Roman Catholic canon is not identical to the Orthodox canon, and it's not identical to the Ethiopian Orthodox canon. So which of these churches gave us the right canon by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Each church claims they did, and yet none of these churches agree on the exact number of books. Therefore, you've done a bad job in telling me what the canon is because you all claim apostolic succession, and you all appeal to the same church fathers, and you call contradict each other and haven't arrived at the same conclusion regarding the number of books. No, they don't dislike Paul. They love Paul. You hear me there? You see the pickle they put themselves in? What does this mean for us Protestants? This is what it means. We don't have to have an inspired list of the books that God has produced by his spirit because God would work through his people in such a way to know what the canon is without that having to be revealed in the scriptures and without this undermining the sufficiency of scriptures. Let me repeat it again. In light of 2 Timothy 3, we can safely conclude that we don't have to have an inspired list of the books that God produced in order to know what the scriptures are because God would work in such a way to move his people to discover those books in order to study those books, to know how to be saved and be complete in his sight, which means that the knowledge of the canon is not something that has to be in scriptures for scriptures to be complete and sufficient. You with me there? If you're confused, put a two because I'm done with my defense of Sola Scriptura. And I was hoping the Orthodox and the Catholics would say something, but no one said anything. Tell me where you're confused so I can help you. And what do you mean, sorry, Sam? Q, are you confused too? Oh, okay. One more time. All right. Think about it. Q, the fact that God didn't give us an inspired list of the books he produced in the Bible means that that is not required for the Bible to com be complete and sufficient because if it was required, then it would be part of the Bible. Otherwise, Paul would be wrong. You with me there? If I had to know with infallible certainty, what the books of the Bible that God produced happened to be, then it would have to be included in the Bible. But since it's not included, that means that's not something necessary for God to reveal as part of the Bible, for me to know what the Bible is, to study it, to grow, learn how to be saved, learn how to live a righteous life,
in order to be complete in the sight of God. Because God would then move the church in such a way to discover those books without that knowledge having to be revealed in the books themselves for those books to be complete. You get it, Q. Because if it was necessary for me to know infallibly, meaning an inspired list of books, to have no doubt what those books were, then according to Paul, it would be part of the scriptures. That they're not part of the scriptures means the, the necessity of having an inspired list of what the books that God produced happen to be is fallacious because I don't need to know that for the Bible to be complete because if I did not need to know that, it would be in the Bible. But since it's not in the Bible, that means we don't need that to be part of the Bible for the Bible to be complete. So Andrew's thinking like a follower of Jesus, and it's time he'll be worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Is that clear? Folks, if you understand sola scriptura, and you understand how to break down 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, there is no refutation of sola scriptura, biblically speaking. None. None. Did you know that? If you understand Sola Scriptura, what it means and what it doesn't mean, and understand the implication of 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, there is no way around the Bible's claim to being thoroughly sufficient. I did last time, Netta. Sola Scriptura is the sole infallible rule of faith, meaning the Bible being produced by God's Spirit is completely reliable, has no errors, completely trustworthy, and gives you everything you need to know to be saved and every good work you must engage in to be complete in the sight of God. So whatever you need to know to be saved will be in the scriptures. Whatever you need to do to be complete in God's sight will be in the scriptures. So tell me something, Nada, that you need to know or do that's not in the scriptures for you to be complete in God's sight. I was going to mention that. Beautiful. You mentioned that, Born Baptist. I'm going to address that now. I was just thinking about 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Excellent, born Baptist. I was going to mention that. Ah, oh, but wait, Sam, we got you. We got you. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. You're destroyed. Okay. Here's the passage I'll use to refute Sola Scriptura. Somebody made the stupid mistake of quoting this. In the comments section on one of my Facebook pages. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Let's read it. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our, our epistle. Bam! We got you, Sam. The traditions that God inspired were passed on orally, word of mouth, or by letter. So you need both. Bam! I got you, Sam. You stumped, sucker. Am I stumped? Number one, since Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians and Paul wrote 2 Timothy, would we expect that Paul would contradict himself? Would Paul contradict himself? Number one. Just want to, just want to say. Number two, since Paul was inspired by the Spirit to write 2 Thessalonians and 2 Timothy, with the Holy Spirit have Paul contradict himself. Now, I'm speaking from the perspective of faith. An atheist doesn't believe in God, let alone that Paul's inspired. For the ones who believe in inspiration, would the Holy Spirit have Paul contradict himself in a matter of two letters? No. Okay. Number three, the third thing to keep in mind, 2 Thessalonians is one of the first letters that Paul wrote. Whereas 2 Timothy is the last letter he wrote before he died. You know that? 2 Thessalonians is one of his first. 2 Timothy is one of the last. Now, with that said, let's go back to 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Oh, my goodness. All right, hold on. Buffering. Is it good now? 
With that said, let's go back to 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Let's see if we can reconcile both statements. 2 Timothy 3, 16 17. Let's start at 15. I'm sorry. Let's include 15 as well. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay. Let's see if there's a way to reconcile these two statements. Paul said, hold on to what I preach to you by word of mouth or by letter. All right. Then Paul, in his last letter, says, Timothy, everything you need to know for salvation in Jesus Christ, it will be found in the scriptures. And every good work you need to engage in to be complete in God's sight will be in scriptures. Okay. Since the Holy Spirit will not have Paul contradict himself, that means whatever Paul taught by word of mouth must be in the scriptures. Otherwise, if there are things that he taught orally that are not in the scriptures, you got a contradiction. However, if the things he taught orally are in the scriptures, you have no contradiction. You have beautiful consistency. Therefore, there can be nothing outside of the Bible that Paul taught that's not in the Bible, which you need to know and do to be complete. If there is, Paul contradicts himself in a matter of two epistles. So either one of them are not inspired or none of them are inspired or the Holy Spirit inspired him to contradict himself. Do you see what I just said? If Paul contradicted himself in two, in a matter of two letters, that means one of them is not inspired, or none of them are inspired, or the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to contradict himself. So, whatever Paul taught orally has to be in the letter, because if it's not in the letter, if there's something he taught orally that I need to know to be saved, or I need to know in order to be complete in every good work, then Paul is contradicting himself. If Steve C., I needed an authoritative list of books, and that's something I needed to have to be complete, and it's not in the Bible, Paul contradicts himself in 2 Timothy 3. You understand, Steve C., the dilemma? Yes, Tony. Whatever was preached orally will be found in sufficient form in the scriptures to get the job done. I'm not saying that what Paul preached orally will be found in all its fullness in the scriptures. What I'm saying is whatever he preached orally will be found in a sufficient manner in the scriptures so that you lack nothing that you need to know to be saved and to live out a life making you complete to God. No, Stephen. The sola scriptura does not mean only authority. Sola scriptura means that it is the only infallible authority, meaning it is an authority produced by God, so it is completely reliable, free of errors. Every other authority can be the authority of the Bible. No, Daryl. Sola scriptura does not teach the Bible as the only authority. You're misreading the Bible because the Bible also says your parents are authorities that you need to submit to. Children submit to their parents. Governments are authorities that you need to submit to as long as they don't make you contradict the word of God or go against the word of God, right? Church elders are authorities you need to submit to. You want me there? Church elders are authorities that you need to submit to. So the Bible is not the only authority. You're misrepresenting Sola Scriptura. The Bible is the only infallible authority because it's the voice of God free of error. There are other authorities that are fallible, can be mistaken in error. So use the Scripture to determine when an authority is speaking truthfully or in error. And all other authorities are subject to Scripture, even the Pope. 
You with me there? So you understand what I said? If there's something in the oral proclamation that's not in the scripture, Paul contradicts himself. So, Or he mentioned a good work necessary for you to do to be complete, not in scripture. He contradicts himself. Therefore, since Paul does not contradict himself, and the Spirit would make sure he doesn't contradict himself, that means whatever he preached orally will be found in its necessary... Okay. Therefore, whatever Paul preached orally will be found in its necessary, succinct, sufficient form in the Bible so that I don't need anything outside of the Bible now that the apostles and their companions have left the earth. No, it only stops for a minute and then it continues. You hear me there? You understand now how 2 Thessalonians 2.15 does not refute sola scriptura? Is it clear? 2 Thessalonians 2.15 does not contradict sola scriptura. No, Daryl. If you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, Daryl, brother, you know, I love you. I'm going to send you on your merry way. You have not stopped for the past 20 minutes trying to make me answer a question that's not relevant to my topic. Brother, please stop. Everyone with me there? You following me? Because I'm not done yet. I may have to just stop with Sola Scriptura today again. Oh, boy. All right. Okay, so the second Thessalonians 2.15 refute Sola Scriptura. Now, brethren, hold fast to the traditions which you receive from me, whether by word of mouth or epistle. Does it refute Sola Scriptura? Does it? I want to see if you got it. Thank the Lord Jesus, medic. But I want to see, okay, so you guys see how 2 Thessalonians 2.15 does not refute Sola Scriptura if you understand what you believe about Sola Scriptura. So don't let the other traditions use 2 Thessalonians 2.15 against you. That means they don't understand your belief or misrepresenting it. But I'm going to give another objection. Hey, I'm going to just stick with Sola Scriptura today because I won't have time to get into the other, other subjects, so I'm going to have to retitle this. If you properly define Sola Scriptura and properly interpret 2 Timothy 3, 14, 17 Q, it is irrefutable. They cannot refute this passage's explicit support of Sola Scriptura. They can't without proving Paul is wrong. Right? Is it clear? Ah, but they, they're they going to have another one. They go, wait, 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 wait. We're going to get you. We're not done yet. John 21, 24, 25. Now watch how this is going to backfire against them. All right. Watch how this is going to backfire against them. John 20, 20, 21, 24, 25. This is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one of I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Ah, see, we got you, Sam. John said Jesus did many things that the books of the earth could not contain. So there are many things not in Scripture. Busted. This again misrepresents Sola Scriptura. Okay, guys, I need your ears. Let me tell you what Sola Scriptura does not teach. Sola Scriptura does not teach that everything God has done or said Everything that Jesus on earth has done or said, 
or everything that the apostles and prophets have done or said are in scriptures. That's not what Sola Scriptura teaches. What Sola Scriptura teaches is everything you need for salvation and holy living, everything necessary for your salvation and holy living is in the scriptures. So Sola Scriptura does not teach the Bible is exhaustive. Sola Scriptura teaches that the Bible is sufficient. You hear me there? Steve, Steve C., let me answer the question by saying, if I need the orthodox interpretation of Scripture to understand Scripture, wouldn't that be in the Scripture itself because the Scripture tells me everything I need? Stephen C., Stephen C., let me repeat it again. If I need the orthodox interpretation of Scripture to understand Scripture, wouldn't the Bible tell me that's what I need in order to be complete? You with me there? So where does the Bible say I need the orthodox interpretation of Scripture to understand Scripture? Because if it's in Scripture, then again demonstrate Scripture tells me everything I need. If it's not in Scripture, they added something to Scripture. It means Scripture is wrong. Do you see now the dilemma again? So if they're able to show me that in Scripture, then they again prove everything I need is in Scripture. But if it's not in Scripture, then that means there's something not in Scripture that I need, which means they just prove Scripture is wrong. So you with me there, Steve C.? Before I move on to John 21, 24, 25 again. I just want to make sure Steve C. got it. You got it? Okay. On, in other words, whatever they tell you you need, they have to show it in Scripture. If it's in Scripture, then they confirm all you need is Scripture because Scripture tells you everything you need. But Steve C., if it's not in Scripture, that means they added something to Scripture, which means Scripture is wrong because it failed to tell me that I needed what they're claiming I need to have to be complete. So Protestant, you see it's suicide, right? Are you guys seeing it? This position is irrefutable. It's irrefutable, isn't it? Irrefutable, right? Okay, now coming back to the issue... John 21, 24 to 25, where it says, Jesus did many things not written. Number one, pay attention now. Pay attention. Number one, Sola Scriptura does not teach everything God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, prophets, apostles, saints have said and done are recorded in scriptures. Sola Scriptura does not teach that the Bible is exhaustive. Sola Scriptura teaches everything necessary, everything you need to know, everything you need to do to be complete in the sight of God is in Scripture so that the Scriptures are sufficient, not exhaustive, right? Number two, the very Gospel of John confirms it. Though John said Jesus did many things not recorded, let's see what John actually said in context. John 20, 30 to 31. John 20, 30 to 31. I don't want to have to end it here. I don't have to change the title. John 20, 30 to 31. And many other signs, surely did Jesus, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but wait, finish it. So he says, I didn't write all of Jesus' miracles. However, what I wrote, verse 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Can I ask you a question? If John just says, I didn't write every miracle that Jesus did down, but what I wrote is sufficient to give you eternal life through faith in Jesus. What I wrote, what I wrote is sufficient to give you eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Then what else do you need besides what he wrote? 
You see how this distorts Sola Scriptura? John just affirmed what Sola Scriptura is. It's not a record of everything Jesus said or did, but it's a record that tells you everything that Jesus said and did that results in salvation so that the Bible gives you everything necessary that is more than sufficient to get you saved. You caught it? So the very passage that they quote against you refutes them. Many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of disciples not written in this book. Finish it. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you may have life through his name. Wait, John. So you're telling me I didn't need to know these other miracles? No, you didn't. That all I need to know is what you wrote to be saved? Yeah, all you need to know to be saved is what I write and believe in what I wrote. That's all you need to be saved. Wow, John, that sounds like Sola Scriptura. John, that sounds like Sola Scriptura, John. That you've given me everything I need to know to be saved so I don't need anything else. Yeah. Ah, but they come back. And this is the final objection. This is the final objection. Oh, then if all you need is John, then what, what need is there of the rest of the books of the Bible? Forget the rest of the books of the Bible. All you need is John. Really? No, no, no. It's the opposite. If John in of itself is sufficient to get me saved, that means now the Bible is super sufficient to get me saved. If John by itself was good enough to get me saved, how much more sufficient is the Bible and its totality to get me saved? So what do I need besides the Bible? You with me there? Are you with me there? So this backfires against them. And they say, oh, see, that's all you need is John. Forget the rest. No, 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 no. It's the opposite. If John is enough to get me saved through faith in Jesus, then you just proved that the Bible is super sufficient to the upteenth degree now that I have the 27, 26 other books of the New Testament and the Old Testament canon. So thank you now for proving the Bible is super sufficient to the upteenth degree to get me saved and teach me how to live for the glory of the triune God. Right? Folks, is there any good argument against the biblical basis for sola scriptura if you define what sola scriptura actually means any argument now do yourselves a favor you need to go back and listen to parts one two and three of the series on sola scriptura re-listen to this understand the arguments by the power of the holy spirit and then teach others and pass on the links. Lord willing, in the description box, I'll put the links to the articles where I discuss this in depth. But you now have heard a thorough case and defense of Sola Scriptura. I promise you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you go back and listen to these sessions, understand the arguments and use them, no one will be able to refute honestly, consistently, the biblical basis for Sola Scriptura, if you know what it means and how to present it. No one, not consistently or honestly. This is why I affirm Sola Scriptura, and Lord willing, I will prove why I affirm Sola Fide. So in those areas, I'm still Protestant because the Bible teaches it. Lord willing, I'll do a session tomorrow, Lord willing, if God wills, and I'll discuss other issues. But I need you to pray for me and my daughters. Please, I'm asking you, pray intensely for me and my daughters. Pray for our health, that they remain healthy. God helps me to get healthy, lose more weight. Pray the Lord will bless us to be holy, to be in love with Jesus, to be covered by the blood of Jesus, to be filled with the Spirit. Pray the Lord will provide our provisions. Pray God will save them from irreparable damage. 
and bring them into my life. Ask the Lord Jesus to help me with an impending court case to set me free to start a new life elsewhere and to bring my daughters to me. Please pray for that. Pray God will now raise up people to partner with me financially to continue to do this work for his glory. Ask God to help me to die to my flesh and these weaknesses and imperfections, impatience, anger, unrighteous indignation, and to walk in the life of the Spirit, to be more like Christ and to love you for the sake of Christ and bless you. And ask the Lord to bless my YouTube channel, the websites I write for, and to use this information to bless the, the people of God for the glory of Christ. I need all these prayers, these blessings, and my daughters need Jesus to fight for them and me. So please pray, right? So Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. If God wills, hit the like button, subscribe, pass it on to others, and pray we get more people for the glory of Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen, Lord Jesus, we love you. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your spirit. Fight for us. Save us from the evil one. And do not let us betray you, shame you, fail you. Please, Lord, keep us in love with you. And bless my children and love them, Lord, and keep them in my life and provide for us. We need you, Lord Jesus. Rebuke the evil one from our lives. Thank you, Lord. You are the Son of God, risen Lord of glory, and we love your word, the Holy Bible, and give us the power to live it out for your glory, in Jesus' name. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Andrew, Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. So check your time zone if the Lord wills. Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.